fifties. And I could go on and on and on. At WFP, change and innovation is part of our DNA. In 1962, we scrambled whatever resources we had to make sure the victims of devastating earthquake in Iran received immediate access to over 1,500 tons of wheat, sugar, and tea. This was WOFU program's first emergency response. In 2015, the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator was launched. It sources, supports, and scales high-impact innovations to disrupt hunger and achieve the SDGs. We do this by incubating and scaling up startups from within and outside of the World Food Program that are collectively assisting to solve world hunger. The program has enabled us to change the climate uh, to change and impact lives of over 9 million people across 67 countries in 2021. These have been in a myriad of areas, from emergency assistance, smallholder farmers, supply chains, innovative financing, supporting over 60 ventures from our partners, to name a few. One relevant example to today's theme is PRISM a platform that tracks the impact of major climatic events and converts them into dashboards that help our teams prioritize assistance to those that need it most. We've made it open source for anyone to use and take advantage of. In 2022, we're shifting gears and focus by partnering directly with governments to make a quantum leap forward, not only in leveraging our financial resources, but more importantly, know-how. To bring economies of scale, to replicate, to scale up, and be sustainable in time. Today, we're honored to join the government of Egypt in this incredible journey with the ministries of international cooperation, environment, communication, and information technology as they embark on a new trail that puts innovation at the forefront of climate change adaptation agenda. As mentioned before, climate change, what could not be visible by Her Excellency the Minister several years back, is very much in the eye of the hurricane, pardon the expression. Um, climate change is even more devastating than conflicts, leaving millions food insecure in its wake. The program but the initiative, climate, could not come at a better moment. The world is attuned to its surrounding. Impact of climate is seen and felt in every walk of life, from raging fire for forest fires, droughts, hurricanes, typhoons, earthquakes, floods, etc., leading the world to invest more resources in this space than ever before, particularly, as mentioned by my colleague, from UNIDO by venture capitalists were about 40 billion in 2021. More work with venture capitalists as a new stream is needed. Climate tech is a new frontier that has not been, tra that has not been transited much in this region and Africa. The rate of return on investment will be exponential and we are when we are successful in this venture. Sorry for the redundancy. Venture funding in this space has skyrocketed, seeing more than 4,000% increase between 2013 and 2019. These, this funding has also become a safer bet. Entrepreneurs all over the world are looking to create multi-billion dollar climate tech unicorns. Therefore, the process of constantly incubating homegrown startups in the climate tech space is essential. So here we are here today to kickstart Climate Tech Run 2022. Uh, <laughs> just making sure I got the year right. Um, and we'll be here at the finish line on December 10th where the winning startups are selected to help continue their journey 
Um, did I miss a page? Nope. Uh, continue their uh, journey after COP27 as they look for new ways to take their ideas to scale. As WP, we're pleased to join hands in this journey by bringing into the fold our innovation accelerator based in Munich that will partner with MOIC, Ministry of Environment, and the Ministry of Communication and Information in sharing the latest lessons and techniques through boot camp system. These are high intensity workshops that help teams deep dive into the problems they are solving, their solution, their business models, and growth plans. Teams also get an opportunity to pitch to a journey for feedback or funding opportunities. I'm reminded of the old African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you, and I wish us all luck. And now it's time to hand the mic over to some of the youth pioneers in climate technology in a panel discussion on climate tech in action. We'll be waiting a few minutes, a few seconds, I hope. So the setup on the stage is ready. As we always say, the youth voices are the power of tomorrow. In a few seconds, young entrepreneurs will walk us through their journey in climate action. I would like to invite to the stage Mr. Mohammed Al Mansouri from Rabbit Mobility, Ms. Radwa Al Amir from Mozara, and Mr. Hazm Salahuddin from Renile. Moderated by Mr. Rami Yaqub, UNIDU Youth Advisor. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, Your Excellencies, um, Dr. Yasmin Fouad, Dr. Ranyan Mashad, and Dr. Amr Talat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues and climate warriors, whether you're joining us here in person or online, welcome and thank you so much for being with us um, in our panel discussion featuring our distinguished speakers from the Climate Tech Startups ecosystem. It's my pleasure to be with you today, and since this is our last session, um, please do allow me to keep it super um, light and short. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, I hope uh, you can stay till the end. My dear panelists, thank you for joining us today. Please do forgive me if I'm a little strict with time management, but other than this, I'm quite sure that our session will be super fun and engaging, listening to your inspiration stories, of course. That said, um, please do allow me to dive right into the context of our session today. As we all know, we live in an era of cascading risks, multiple crises, and a challenging state of uncertainty that affects each and every one of us. The biggest crisis, climate change, is so critical that if not tackled soon, it could potentially make any other problem facing our, wor our world kind of irrelevant. Not an exaggeration, by the way. But we're a generation that is not only tech savvy, but also that learned to view challenges as opportunities, aren't we? So climate change is an opportunity, an opportunity for us to create positive impact on our communities and leave lasting legacies through our technology. Today, we showcase real life examples of entrepreneurs and leaders who are working on ground using innovative technology to combat climate change and in turn, ultimately save our planet. Among many sectors in which climate tech is becoming absolutely important, we focus today on three vital 
sectors, water, transportation, as well as agriculture and food security. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce my panel of guest speakers from the Climate Tech Startups ecosystem. First, we have Mr. Mohammed Al-Mansouri. Mohammed is the co-founder and chief operating officer of Rabbit Mobility. He was a former McKinsey consultant in London Dubai offices. He is also an economics engineer who graduated from the American University in Cairo. His company, Rabbit Mobility, is a ride-sharing app for short-distance transportation using environmentally friendly vehicles. Rabbit Mobility are available in 14 districts across five cities in Egypt. Their fleet includes electric bikes, and e um, as well as a plan to add e-mopeds. Their vision is to be the go-to solution for any trip under eight kilometers in Africa and the Middle East, whether it's for a commute or even delivery. So they're sort of transforming transportation in the region. Welcome with us, Mohammed. Thank you. Second, we have Ms. Radwal Amir. Radwa is a social enterprise thrive who worked in fields of communications, development, community engagement, capacity building training, financial and gender inclusion. She helps organizations to create a solid network of stakeholders and partners to maintain sustainable business lines and create a positive impact. Her company, Muzera, is an agri-fintech company that aims to disrupt the agricultural sector in Egypt and the MENA region by becoming the go-to super app for all farmers' agri and non-agri financial needs. So you're mainly digitalizing agriculture. It's great to have you with us, Radwa. Finally, we have Mr. Hazim Salah Hazim Hazim is the founder and CEO of Renile. He is also a business consultant for the Electronics Factory, part of the Arab Organization for Industrialization. He holds a bachelor's degree in engineering and bioprocess uh, engineering from Zouil City and a master's degree in engineering management from Arizona State University. His company, Renile, is a leading environmental solution an agri-tech company providing end-to-end -end solutions for smart farming using the Internet of Things, IoT, and provide cutting-edge real-time online analytics that help enhance the production efficiency and reduce consumption of their consumers. So your products can help businesses, or specifically farms, in digital monitoring, alarming, and control. Super excited to know how so. Thanks for joining us, Hazen. Lovely to have you all. Um, are you ready to start a discussion? Super, super. Let me start then with Mohammed and Rabbit Mobility. Um, could you please first give us a few words on your company? Um, so I think you've said it all. Uh, we're a ride-sharing app. We offer short-distance transportation using uh, basically vehicle sharing. So we have electric bikes, electric scooters. Um, we have a plan to also introduce electric mopeds and potentially even uh, mini electric cars. Uh, but that's me spoiling the plan. Um, the idea here is it's a pretty straightforward uh, user-friendly app. You open it, it shows you a map of all the vehicles that are around you. You go to the nearest one, usually it should be less than two minutes away. You scan a QR code, you ride the scooter or the bike um, until you get to your destination. And once you're there, you just uh, park it responsibly, lock it, take a picture, and you pay automatically through the app. Um, like you said, we are available now in more than five cities in Egypt. We um, uh, are planning to establish a footprint outside of Egypt before end of year. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, generally it. Can you tell us who your target groups are and how do they perceive climate change? So um, I think the most important thing to, to highlight here is that our target audience is anyone who is 16 years of age or older who, is, who hates traffic. And that's basically how it all started for us. We had been stuck in traffic for so many hours that we couldn't keep up. Uh, and my co-founder and I, or my co-founders, Kamel, Bessem, and myself, we, this is where it started. So uh, basically any person who uh, is 16 years or, of age or older and is seeking to do a trip that is less than eight kilometers of distance, which is the like universally defined short distance trips. Uh, and uh, just to give you some context, like around 50% of trips in Egypt are done uh, are less than uh, three kilometers, and around 80% are less than uh, eight kilometers. So that's a massive population. Um, they want to get outside of the traffic. They want to enjoy their commute instead of dread it. And for them, a massive added benefit is to do it in an environmentally friendly way. Uh, and that's why we constantly get very positive feedback from our users that our app shows how much carbon dioxide emissions they have saved during their trips. Super interesting. That's quite a lot of um, new information to me. 
Um, let's talk numbers, though. Numbers are always good. Can you give us one piece of data that showcases your positive impact on the climate? Uh, it, it's always tough to pick just one number, but I think the most salient one would be that we... You can pick more. <laughs> okay, now you're putting me in the spot. Um, I would say uh, just since the beginning of 2022, we have saved more than 50,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions by replacing car trips that are relying on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Um, but as you know, still not everyone has access to mobile apps, right? Um, do you plan how, somehow to expand or look into reaching this percentage of the population that can't easily access your services? Um, if so, what are your plans? If not, do you suggest any other alternatives? Although it might be a small percentage or the mobile apps are growing, but still there is a percentage. I would like to hear from you. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I think you have a very good point there. Um, I mean, I think it's important to highlight that in Egypt, actually, digital penetration has grown massively over the past few years. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, the Digital Egypt report in 2021 recalled some numbers which are the mobile penetrations that are around 90%, the internet penetrations that are around 55%. So that's, that's, you're talking around 55 million people who have access to internet and are struggling in their day-to-day -day lives. So that's a massive market with a big problem to solve. Massive, uh, yeah. But that being said, there's still, of course, a lot more that can be captured. And that's where we're very keen to integrate with maybe the public transportation network. We've been reading a lot about the uh, unified NFC card that can be used for the metro and bus. For us, that would be perfect because many people are struggling to do their first mile, last mile, um, and that's where uh, something like an integration with Rabbit would uh, offer them a way to just do their whole trip using one card, and they start their trip on a scooter or a bike, they get to their metro station, they do another trip, and then when they get there, they continue on another scooter and bike, um, and, and, and basically the entire system becomes integrated. Right. I'm, I'm kind of thinking on the spot here, can governments, can international organizations help you with that? Absolutely. I think um, just sponsorship from uh, all the different ministries that we're interacting with um, is, is, is really key for us. We've, we've received massive support over the past, um, since the beginning of the year. We've worked with uh, all the different ministries. Uh, we've, we're working on the licensing with the uh, LTRA under the Ministry of Transport. We're working with the Governorate of Sharm el-Sheikh and the Ministry of Planning regarding uh, operating Rabbit in um, Sharm el-Sheikh prior to COP27 and during and then afterwards to continue there. Um, we're also uh, working with uh, the Customs Authority on things like recategorizing the electric, light electric vehicles as uh, electric transportation modes. So these should not be um, treated uh, similar to other um, like electric uh, kits or electric uh, oh, toys absolutely. and so on. And um, like electric cars, they should get like zero uh, customs, but that's not the case yet. But Honestly, we're seeing massive support, and uh, it's, it's really exciting going forward. It's promising. I, I can see that. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. It was very enlightening to me uh, to hear about Rabbit Mobility. Thank you so much for the valuable information. Thank you, Rami. And uh, I'm really honored and humbled to be here in front of all of you guys. Uh, it's, it's a huge pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much for being with us. Um, OK, Radwa, are you ready? I'm going to move to Radwa next. Um, so um, could you, again, some questions that I asked Mohammed are going to be similar to the ones I'm going to ask you. Sure. Uh, could you please give us a few words on your company just to start with? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. So I'm representing Muzera. Muzera means farmer in Arabic. We are really working on such name, uh, <laughs> name adaptation here. So we are the farmer's partner. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> so we are the farmer's partner. This is our slogan. We mainly tackle four main problems when it comes to agriculture to maintain like a food security, uh, a trusted, traceable value chain and a sustainable one. So first of all, we provide farmers with the tools needed to maintain, number one, access to markets. All farmers actually know how to farm and cultivate, but they don't know what exactly is needed to be cultivated. So we provide access to markets through our network of uh, exporters, manufacturers, and food processors. 
uh, through a module well known in Egypt called contractual farming. So we uh, introduce the whole model to the farmer way beginning, before the beginning of the season. We sign, them, uh, we sign with them contracts on exact amounts and acres they have. We uh, establish like more of a follow-up system and we introduce the tech side, which is quite revolutionary to all farmers in Egypt here. So this all uh, begins by the beginning of the season. And then we provide access to finance because if he knows what he has to farm, he does not have enough money to get the seeds and stuff and get ready for the process. So actually we uh, pay down payments, all of that is digital, uh, through uh, electronic payments and stuff, whether it's bank cards or electronic transactions. And we provide them with the seeds needed, seedlings, fertilizers and pesticides, which is all recommended with, through the best agriculture practices, which is totally recommended by the team in order to mitigate carbon uh, emissions and stuff. So we have defined what market we need to access. We have get the money to start. So we don't leave them through the journey all alone. We provide agronomy support all the way, whether through field visits, face-to-face -face meetings, which is their favorite. <laughs> and the revolutionary thing, we provide it through their own favorite channels. Everyone has a mobile app so far because of Corona, <laughs> because of COVID. Actually, that was quite an opportunity. It was a spike. <laughs> So it's, it, it was quite an opportunity um, to just have everyone online because of the whole COVID thing. So everyone has TikTok, WhatsApp, Facebook. So I remember being in one of the seminars with the farmers. Why not having one extra app to make sure we're making money through? So everyone is super excited for such new intervention, like can an app let me make money? So that was uh, the new resistant thing like they, they don't get it yet until we have made some success stories and improved that and prove that some of the farmers have already uh, made some money with us so we provide the agronomy support as i said field to field field visit face to face and through their own favorite channels whether it's through the phone through uh, whatsapp or facebook or whatever uh, app they are using and all of that is being introduced to the farmers through the first agriculture value added services center in the middle east so far we call it Farmer 360. It's a centralized contact center. All of it managed by women, extension engineers, culture. <laughs> we are uh, technically uh, supporting the opportunities for women in such sector, especially in the agronomy support field. And last but not least, the real pain point in the life of the farmer is the payment. So if I just cultivated the whole thing for you, upon the harvest, I just need my money. Usually they wait for the middlemen or the buyers to sell the crop and come back to them and give them the money. So technically we have fixed that by on-time payments upon the harvest. So once we harvest and the buyer or the post-harvest unit just received it, through our mobile application, some guy just clicked delivered and then it's automatically transacted the money into the, the farmer bank account. Uh, so I remember one time incident we have been updating the system and just everything went down and the contact center received numerous calls like where is our money? <laughs> is the bank account is corrupted or something? So we were so happy actually. I mean, that was a minor lag. We were somehow annoyed by the incident, but at the same time, we were so happy that they are usually checking the app and especially for checking their own money, which is one of our main targets, like financial inclusion. Everyone has to have that uh, uh, bank card. He has to understand what is a financial product. What does it mean to have like an, an integrated system? What is a notification and so on? So uh, we have a long journey to go. And on the other side, with the, with the buyer side, we, as I said by the beginning of my talk, we ensure uh, a traceable value chain. We ensure quality and quantity agreed upon the contract because our steps usually starts with the buyer. So once I define my buyer, I define technically the order and turn it into application with the smallholder farmers. And we technically target the smaller ones, those who own from one acre up to 20 acre. So we believe that those are the segment who just cannot find a buyer. So we are, we are helping them through that. Wow. Um, <laughs> thank you for your work and for your efforts. Thank you. Super important, super timely. Thank you. Especially regarding the part about women. Women are the most vulnerable group to climate change. Thank you for what you're doing. You're uh, I'm not going to ask you what, who are your target groups, because obviously they're farmers. <laughs> but um, how do they perceive climate change? 
So um, I do believe they are quite uh, relieved to find someone who would help them in finding a buyer because this is one main pain point across one of our surveys to identify what the problems that they are facing. I do believe the first top five problems were quite commercial, has nothing to do with farming. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we believe that we are, uh, this is the main journey with the farmers, finding a buyer uh, and ensure that they are cultivating and doing the effort with that exact needed crop, not mm -hmm. just any other crop. Okay, back to numbers. Yes. Do you have one piece of data that you're proud of? Okay, um, I'm quite proud of uh, having um, across, we, we have launched back in April 2021, so across the first year we have made like 10 million plus EGP uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of revenues, and that was quite interesting because we have introduced wow. new varieties to the market, and the farmers were not afraid actually to just farm something new, you know. They have always uh, get to those like ongoing and quite non uh, crops like wheat, like uh, yeah, whatever crops they are used to, to used to, cro to, to cultivate. But then we are just introducing the new stuff, and they are quite interesting because it still makes money, and it still has a buyer, so why not? So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud of that. We have, uh, at the very moment, we have more than 3,000 uh, contracted farmers on our app. We have more than 15,000 on the pipeline. Whether uh, they are still giving it a thought, whether they would choose the crops we're working on, they are still giving it a shot to just realize and watch enough success stories from those we are sharing to just believe that we are helping them to make money. So we, we have a long journey coming up. See, numbers are always great. Forgive me, I'm, I come from an engineering background. I like numbers. <laughs> um, okay, I have a question that perhaps you touched upon, mm -hmm. but um, I would like for you to maybe um, explain a little further on that. How can your technology reach the ordinary farmers, the grassroots? Mm -hmm. um, and again, you said how can it help them, but if you can, again, say a few more words about that, I would be grateful. Sure. Um, actually, we, have, we are approaching farmers, especially those smallholders who just own like one acre. So an owner of one acre technically might, may not have a smartphone, honestly. However, his son or his daughter, his wife may have one. So technically, we are making the best use out of social media, having those announcements like, guys, we are in for Sesame, who's in? So they are actually sub signing up or subscribing or just filling in a simple form that I have X amount of acres, I live in the exact village in that govern rate, and I'm willing to, to, to help you farm, uh, farm sesame, and that's it. Also, we are working closely with the cooperatives because we believe they have a, a huge network, like the ministry, uh, the ministry of Solidarity has tons of a huge number of uh, cooperatives and civil based associations so we technically work closer uh, to those guys because they are the leader of their own communities yeah, so yeah. in order to just penetrate a community or being a part of a certain community i have to knock the right door i believe so we are using the social media for the whole yeah, uh, yeah. whole watchers here and we are also working closely with the cooperatives so we right. are approaching them again to introduce the tech through tech and through normal channels, because right. it's, you, you cannot just change um, a 30 or 40 years back habit in just one yeah. year, yeah. no way. <laughs> thank you so, so much, thank you so much, Radwa. Um, very inspirational, thank you. Um, thank you a lot. I'll move on quickly to Hazim. Uh, a few words uh, very quickly on your company, Renile, please. Yeah, I know the time is shorter now and we have to go quickly. I have to run a little bit, I apologize <laughs> yeah, I for know, that. I know. Okay, first, Renile is uh, an agri-tech company. We are working uh, especially in IoT systems uh, for farmers. We are manufacturing some IoT devices uh, to put in the water or uh, for fish farming or in the land uh, to measure some parameters like BHDO temperature and all of these items and send it to the farmer uh, through mobile app or through website to monitor his farm uh, online. And if any problem appear in the farm, it's in the notification about how to solve this problem, uh, about how to increase his productivity and how to uh, controlling some items like if uh, that solvent oxygen decrease in fish farming, uh, we are opening paddles uh, autonomously or sending him to open these paddles and give him full data analytics about the farm itself. In addition to giving him full farm management system about the inventory, about the farmers, about the fish itself, uh, and the best time to, to fishing his, uh, his fish. Uh, and it's, it's obvious now that uh, our clients as uh, farmers, 
uh, not only in fish farming, we are uh, tackling uh, uh, hydroponics, aquaponics, greenhouses, and some clients of Muzaira and others. <laughs> uh, we, have, uh, we have many clients in greenhouses also to, to help them to irrigate their systems well and uh, saving some water and saving some uh, feeds and besides in the, in the feeding itself. Right. And for numbers. Numbers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, we are saving uh, some of operating costs of the clients we have in, in only one, and, and, uh, one year and a half, uh, 170 clients across the region. Mm. We're saving about uh, 30 to 35 percent of their operating cost, and most of them coming from the electricity cost. Uh, and most of them working uh, their electricity with uh, diesel fuels or something because they are in uh, rural areas and uh, they don't have any access to electricity. So we're decreasing the carbon emissions from uh, the electricity itself and from the diesel itself. Can I ask you an interesting question about our initiative today that we're launching today? Have you been a part of any initiatives or competitions like the Climate Tech Run before? Yes. How do you see them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is a lot of uh, competitions trying to do uh, uh, a lot of things to find the COP27 because we have uh, it now in, in, in Egypt. Uh, maybe Google, we are a part of Google uh, competition and we are uh, having a lot of VCs here in Egypt. Maybe we have Hazims and IEEE and others uh, now. And we got some, com some incubations from ICT and from, uh, from the Ministry of uh, Communication. Uh, so there is a lot in, now uh, nowadays, but there is no roadmap uh, to find how to finalize what's, what's next, what's the action plan. Uh, so we will make this, uh, this startup, we will support this startup, and we will support this initiative. But what's next? Uh, we have to support all the stakeholders. We have to increase uh, maybe uh, the culture of people. Uh, I know there is some propaganda due to the COP27, but they have to, uh, they have to continue this propaganda. Course, they have to continue course. these items, yeah. Uh, especially in, in, uh, in energy sector and the informing sectors. Uh, that's it. I agree. I hope it's not a momentarily trend that is going to fade away. I hope it continues. Um, thank you so much, Hazim. Thank you, um, Super, super. Um, I think we have reached the end of our session. My colleagues are telling me that Please, please, Your Excellency. ومحتاجة بس أعمل one quick reflection عشان الوقت يعني بتاعكم بتاع طبعا السادة الحضور uh, it's very interesting all your work and let me try to connect between that development part and that digital part that is perfectly fits within the, the, the criteria for the competition which is tech and the climate part. The first one is a pure climate one because that works more on a sustainable transport and that's quickly linked to climate. The other two still lack the climate part in it. So what is really important for you to do besides you've honestly mentioned that it's a commercial problem having an access to the market. We need to add to that the weather forecast and an early warning system. So when the farmers are having all the planning process, it's not the idea of the cultivation and having the access to market. It's the idea is that if there is a problem in the temperature, a very high temperature, a very low temperature, my all cultivation in the crops will not work out. What kind of new crops could be done? And that needs to also be linked to the research institution. And we're ready to give that kind of additional part within your application. For the second application for the fish farming, we need also to add a parameter. I understand that you have the pH parameter, all the parameters that l relates to the stock of the fish farmers. However, how the change in the temperature would affect the fish farming, whether that is a parameter, yes or no, if that could be linked, that would help them to do a further forecasting. Another part related to the climate part, which is more of adaptation, which is how can the different kinds of fish that they are used in farming better adapt to cold water, to hot water, to change in temperature, and what kind of fish that they need to farm. This is also something that we can advise for. If those two very small parts add to your application, that will make it a climate tech. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for this valuable intervention. Um, 
thank you all, thank you our audience. Um, I would like to re-announce that the finalists of the Climate Tech Run will pitch their startups at the biggest climate event of the year, COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, here in our beloved Egypt. Thank you all, and I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, our speakers, our moderator. Well done. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before